like to welcome everybody here today at the Citizens Forum. And we're going to kick off the show today with uh, a short interview of, uh, of someone who just popped into town that's kicking off a, a launching of a, of a small booklet that uh, outlines the events around the, the student protests and demonstrations in Quebec in 2012. Uh, I want to welcome Stefan Christophe to the, to the show today. And uh, Stefan's just going to give us a, a brief outline of what the, the booklet's all about and what he thinks, uh, why he thinks it's important to see this in British Columbia. Welcome, Stefan. Thank you so, for, so much for having me. You're very welcome. So I, I, I'm going to first ask you to give us the name of the, of the book here. Okay. And it's it, uh, Le, Le Fond de l'Air est Rouge, which translates roughly to The Essence of the Air is Red, and that's a reference to the red square that you saw students who were striking in 2012 wearing on their clothes. And that red square symbolized uh, their grievance, their frustration, uh, their demands for accessible university post-secondary education in Quebec. And that was really the essence of the student strike in 2012, that demand for accessible education. It seemed to expand out into many other issues very yeah, quickly. Sure. And I saw that, you know, there was so many uh, non-students but the participated and it was a very impressive uh, event for for people out here in the West to watch that happen it was very uplifting uh, and uh, sort of was nice to see somebody some somebody in Canada some group in Canada actually making some headway by actually getting on the streets and uh, trying to make things happen so um, basically could you just give us a brief outline of some of the topics you've covered in the booklet sure well, the Quebec student strike of 2012, what it was about was the questioning of contemporary Quebec society. The student movement is built on a history. This is dating back to the period that we would remember as called the Quiet Revolution right. in the late 1960s and early 1970s, where the demand for accessible, publicly funded universities began to take shape. And that's really where also the student federations, where in Quebec they're organized more like labor unions, let's say in the rest of Canada, and represent students politically, began to form. And that demand to uh, do away with tuition fees really began to take root in Quebec society. So in many ways that demand to keep universities accessible is one of the unanswered dreams of the Quiet Revolution. So the strike in 2012 is very much linked to this history in Quebec. Right. So that's really what it was about. And it was about uh, a new liberal imposed tuition fee by the former government of Jean Charest, the Liberal Party of Quebec, who tried to hike tuition at about 80%. They were unsuccessful because hundreds of thousands of people went onto the streets and actually uh, forced an election in which Jean Charest fell and that tuition hike was cancelled. So it was actually people power that did away with um, the tuition hike. So uh, it, the, the demonstrations did play a significant role in the provincial election in your view? Oh, absolutely. Now, do you think uh, the new premier is an improvement over, the, uh, over Jean Charest? Do you think Pauline Marois is uh, going to be, let's say, more progressive? Well, I think what we're talking about in relation to what happened in Quebec in 2012 is a, a moment of social upheaval that was yeah. profound. The new government is in no way represents the ideals that were expressed on the street. Yeah. You know, we're talking about a radically different society where social justice would be more uh, embraced, um, you know, and corporate power would be clawed back and the environment would be respected. Those are the things that people were talking about. Certainly yeah. the new government in Quebec under Pauline Marois is, uh, has taken some progressive steps, but not enough. Yeah. And the booklet, what I'm trying to do is basically tell the story of what happened in Quebec in 2012 to share it with people in Canada. It's in English because yeah. so much of what took place in Quebec was lost in translation. This is no doubt about it because, you know, uh, even though we tried to follow the politics, uh, the coverage wasn't that good. So you're having a book launching. Uh, where is that going to happen? Well, I've been doing them across Canada and right. I'm doing one here in Victoria at Camus Books. Um, on Quadra Street. Right, yeah. so we'll be seeing this next week, so you'll yeah. be gone. Yeah. But uh, well, I want to wish you good luck with this. I certainly want to get a copy of this myself. <laughs> and uh, it's very heartening to see uh, this sort of thing happening and the energy you're putting into it. And uh, 
I've always told my friends, you know, the Quebec is the best province in Canada. They want to get out of the Federation. So I don't know one to really understand why, but, yeah. but um, I just think it's great that you've done this and it's really going to help. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Have a nice day. Same to you. Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum, uh, part two, I guess, today. Uh, this is being filmed on Wednesday, July 24th. Um, first part of Citizens Forum is also always the Walter and Jack show. So, Walter, you just did an interview with uh, Stefan talking about the uh, Quebec student uh, movement, I guess. And, you know, I was listening and one thing he said was that what it was really about was, I think, social justice, less corporate power, and respect for the environment. And, I mean, I'm all for all of those things. And it's funny that through the entire year that the, the student movement was happening, I don't think the media ever put it in those terms even once. And that's the power of the media, and that's the role they play, is to, because they put it in terms of greedy students wanting more. Uh, I mean, is that your recollection? Well, I, 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 because I had some other background, I knew a little bit more about it, but not, you know, when I looked at it, and, and something we could have talked about is, is how poorly the CBC covered it. And uh, the CBC could have done a lot better on that, on those topics. Now, is that by accident, or is that deliberate decisions being made to make sure that the rest of Canada is not told of these, I mean, radical ideas, environmental protection, you know, taking care of the planet, social justice, and less corporate power. Well, it's power. the Stephen Harper CBC. It's the, and this, so, yeah. you know, there's a really powerful force, and it's right at the top, that tries to steer uh, the the tone and, and the direction of a lot of stories. Would the Justin Trudeau CBC be any different, do you think? Well, you know, it gets so in institutionalized. I mean, it's really a corporate model of uh, media. So uh, there's a lot of great folks in the CBC. Oh, absolutely, still. yes. And and uh, and good things happen. But when you see like a national story like that, and it's not reported correctly, not honestly, you know, they could, you know, they got off into a place where they were really misrepresenting what these people were doing. And um, well, what was the CBC saying? Well, the CBC was more or less presenting a story like you were saying. Like it sounded like students just didn't want to pay any more for t t tuition. And everybody else in Canada has to pay for tuition. What are these greedy little students doing not wanting to pay tuition? But the thing is, is that what's happening in Quebec is that they were, uh, always have uh, advocated for a very low tuition or free tuition for university. And as, as a fundamental right uh, that everyone should have. I mean, this is a very, very progressive idea. And Quebec society uh, in general reflects a lot of those sort of sentiments and, and really uh, they're the leaders in many, many ways. And I think um, they're going to bear the brunt perhaps of some of those ideas in the future because as I say, you know, the, the federal government is certainly not going in that direction. Yeah. So anyways, the ideas of social justice, less environmental power and uh, let's take care of our planet. I mean, to me, there's nothing more important and that we should all be doing that all the time. Um, so Walter, you're an electrician and uh, I was gonna ask you, how many electricians are there in, let's say, in parliament? I know, it's a good question. You know, I don't think there are any. Yeah. And, and I don't, you know, you know, I know what point you're making. It's just, you know, you don't see, uh, Real working people. folks in in uh, in those positions usually there's so there's, there's uh, pro let's say there's no electricians there's probably no carpenters no plumbers no tradesmen in general no waiters no waitresses no taxi cab drivers no bus drivers nobody who works in a grocery store none of these people the real people except Jack in Quebec in the in the federal NDP yes. We had a few, a sprinkling of yes. some uh, people that got elected. And that was because nobody thought they'd get elected, so the real power brokers didn't even bother. Oh, yeah. Right? One person That's was off on our holidays during yeah. the whole yeah. campaign, and she was elected. So what we seem to be getting is more and more professional politicians in the federal parliament and in our provincial legislatures. And that is a dangerous situation, I think, for us all, because... Professional politicians are a whole different kettle of fish, and they don't, from what I see, they don't represent really the people who elect them. Um, they want to get elected, 
they do very well as professional politicians. I think, you know, I think there should be a term limit of three, four, five years, and then you're out. And you should never lose track of your career, whatever that is, when you're in the parliament. Yeah. So that when you get out, you're still in touch with whatever your job was, be it working in a store. And we need people in our parliaments and legislatures who come from the real world, the world that we all live in, not... Well, it, it's, you know, what so... It, that just makes you so angry and frustrated is 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 the, the unrealness of it all the un, of, of, of politics in general and in British Columbia Especially. you know the last provincial election you know we we saw how unreal it all can get and and and, and the it's so uh, you know it's so excruciating to experience the opposition right now the NDP in, in, in the legislature hammering away on some points that, and they're very they're unwilling to talk about the most important things like for instance you're talking I mentioned the deficit right now so I think they're, they're just professional uh, sort of uh, mouthpieces for public relations firms who write pretty well everything for them yeah and and it's really it, it just isolates the, 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 the citizens from their own government so the important thing, or one important thing, is for us to solve that problem. And I think the first step is for, you know, somebody to say it and uh, people to be thinking about it a little bit more. Um, it's, these are, the, I think, the fundamentally important points and directions that we've got to go in. It, it's, it's more important, I think, than even the pipelines or you know whatever the issue yeah. of the day is because i don't think we can solve the pipeline problem the job problem the debt problem the everything problem as long as the fundamental truths in our society remain the same because that's what got us here yeah so as long as our politicians don't work for us we don't have democracy the corporations own the media and the corporations control the politicians if we can't change those things then nothing else is going to change. And I think we can all see the trajectory we're on, which is, you know, somewhere between we're circling the drain and we're, we've fallen off the building and we've passed the eighth <laughs> floor, but we still think everything is looking pretty well, good. Well, you're looking for more analogies to try to figure out how do you explain this. But, you know, the U.S. government is a prime example. They call themselves the world's premier democracy. That's how Americans introduce their federal government. It's totally constipated. Nothing happens there. Actually, lots of things happen there. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah? Lots of things happen. All the things that we don't want are happening. Yeah. And all the things we do want, as you say, the, the government is locked. But somehow they've managed over these last 10 years of gridlock when nothing can get done, they've managed to create a total 1984 spy system that is <laughs> looking into the phone calls, emails, everything of everybody, I mean, all done under the radar. They've put their nation trillions of dollars into debt. Yeah. I mean, oh, so they've done a lot, but... But, but what, what one of the things that we really need to create a stable, just society, and those are the things I'm talking about, and also yeah. try to steer the ship away from the rocks environmentally. Uh, you know, there are things that could happen. But I think the chances of uh, that happening in a federal level in Canada is not very good right now. Uh, and provincially, we've seen what's happening there. We might have chances to change things in a local municipal level. And we have some people fighting, say, for instance, the sewage treatment plant and things of that nature. And I think we have to work where we can to try to make some changes and, and build on it. And hopefully a little bit of honesty and integrity comes back into the system. I'm just saying that I think all of our jobs, all of, all of us, the millions of us across Canada who work for social justice, for environmental protection, for democracy, there's millions of us. I think our jobs would be a lot easier if our governments that we elect and pay, if they actually thought about us once in a while and, and thought they worked for us, and if we had a media that worked for us and told us the truth, I think all of us would be a lot better off in our quests for whatever justice we're looking for. So I think it's important that we put a little bit of our focus yeah. on those very issues. Let's, 
Let's first of all realize how totally corrupted the, the corporate media is. It doesn't tell us the truth. It's a propaganda machine. So I think it's important people keep that in mind. And then secondly, how do we start to build a media that will help us out of the, the mess we're being put into? And it takes money, it takes time, it takes people. Well, That's you know, right. everybody watching this has money, time, people, one, one of them maybe. So contribute as you can because it's an important issue. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, local politics. I just want to say amalgamation. Um, one thing I don't like about amalgamation is that it's been pushed so strongly by CFAX Radio for a number of years. And when I see that happening, I think, are they pushing something because it's good for us, the people of this city? Or are they pushing something because it's good for the corporate owners of CFAX? And, you know, of course, I fear the worst. Um, but I think, you know, that there is a group that's formed, Amalgamation, yes. Um, so it's worth discussion, but we've got to have, we've got to have good information. We've got to have good information. Uh, you know... How about this though, Jack? I mean, uh, and I see both sides of this. You know, you get all these municipalities, all these different little rules and regulations and, you know, a hundred mayors and all. The thing is, is that there's a chance of having real democracy when you have very small scales. You know the people, you know the councillors and stuff like that. That's really great. On the other side, it's, it's always the little these fiefdoms that are going on. The problem right now, I think you know, one of the solutions we should be looking at is strengthening the CRD, electing the CRD directly. Not this appointment by the mayor and all these crazy little formulas they use. And, and you have these people on, for instance, that want to have this crazy sewage treatment thing that nobody, honest to God, does anybody want it? I don't know if anybody wants it. But you can't really get to these guys and say, hey, you don't do, if you do this, you're, you know, uh, you, you know, you're not going to get elected because they're so removed from, from where they get elected. Nobody ran, as far as I know, say, elect me and I'm going to bring that sewage treatment plant to town. I, don't, I never heard that line anywhere. So, we have to get that CR, the CRD to be directly elected. It's too important. It's handling billions of dollars of money right now per year, or not per year, but, but millions per year. And uh, it's totally unaccountable. I think if we had a good CRD, we would need an amalgamation. That may be true. Uh, one thing I would like is for our local media to tell us which people on the CRD are supporting sewage treatment. Because who it seems to be that's, that's gotten us into the mess we're in are four people from Victoria okay. who are on the CRD sewage treatment committee and four from Saanich. I, don't even, I, I won't even try to remember who the names, but Dean Fortin for sure is one of them. Who are, they, you know, who are they representing? The media should be telling us what these individual people are voting for, and then we can go after them if we want to. No, this is very important. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, here's something. Uh, this is in the, the local newspaper today, the local free newspaper. Um, Wednesday, December, or July 24th. The headline says, DC <coughs> deficit tops $1.1 billion. And I must say I'm kind of shocked uh -huh. because the election was almost exactly two months ago, and I don't remember at all being told that we had a deficit of 1.1 billion. Weren't, weren't the Liberals saying we were going to be debt free and they had a balanced budget? I mean, that's kind of what I remember. I, am I completely off base in, in my recollection? <laughs> I know. I remember John Cretchen was asked a question, something about some money went missing or something. And he said, well, a million dollars here, a million dollars there, what are you going to do? Well, in British Columbia, it's sort of like a billion dollars here or there. They can say whatever they want in the election campaign. And they're running a deficit. And that's, this is just what they're declaring. We know how badly they're in the hole if you start talking BC Hydro. And uh, yawn, everybody goes back to sleep and drinks their uh, rum, rums and Cokes or what during the summer. And I think what we need is sort of an ongoing election so that after the election, we can do something about these people over the next four years. I mean, we, 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 we're told we live in a democracy. We vote, which takes yeah. three minutes. We vote seemingly based on a pack of misinformation and lies yeah. fed to us by the politicians and the media. 
and then all of a sudden, you know, everything changes, but there's nothing we can do for the next four or five years. There's something wrong with this picture. Well, you know, that's what I'm saying. It just, it just, it makes you so angry and upset, and you, and you wonder, what? how can they do that? <laughs> how can they do that? And then, then, uh, then they, they just continue on. You know, it's just, uh, that's the system that we have to crack. We have to find out some way of not letting this happen. Okay, last question uh, or comment. Here's, here it is. Did, did the Nazis really lose World War II or did they leave Germany, move to the United States and take over that country along with the American Nazis who were already there in the 1940s? That's quite a question, Jack. I mean, if you look at the trend during the 30s and 40s, there was worldwide fascism. The worldwide trend right across the world of a very, very radical, you know, uh, we want to call it right wing, but it's even beyond that ideology. And Germany was the pinnacle of it. Uh, the war didn't really change a lot of that ideology. And I think, as you say, uh, uh, United States seem to have been the victors of that war, and they seem to have appropriated a lot of the, a lot of the the uh, ideas of the people they were fighting. Yeah, and I don't mean this in any way as a as a statement against the American people. It's just the people who run the country. I mean, the American people have as little to do with the running of their country as the Canadian people have to do with the running of our country. It seems, but democracy is important. A free press is important. I think we should all keep those two things in mind. Uh, Walter, thank you very much for this segment of the Walter and Jack Show. Always and, a pleasure, Jack. And thank you for watching.